Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Alamosaurus, as well as some really awesome dinosaur news. And first, we just want to say a big thank you to our Patreon supporters who have gone to patreon.com slash I know dino and pledged a little bit of money a month to help us run this podcast, which is really appreciated. We put a lot of effort into it and it always seems to take more time than we think it will. So if you're interested in supporting us, you can go to patreon.com slash I know dino. And thanks again to all our supporters. So the reason I'm so excited about dinosaur news is because of our first item. It's an article published in Paleontological Contributions titled The First Giant Raptor, Theropoda Dromaeosauridae, from the Hell Creek Formation. And you're probably aware of the Hell Creek Formation. That's the one where T-Rex and Triceratops and all these dinosaurs that are super popular and famous are from. But there hadn't been any Dromaeosaurid, which is like Utah Raptor or some of these other ones. This article is written by Robert A. De Palma and some others, including Pete Larson, who we interviewed back in our first episode, and Robert Bacher, who is also famous, but we haven't interviewed him. And as the title and associated authors might imply, this is a really awesome discovery, like I've already been talking about. So they describe Dakota Raptor Steini, and it's named after South Dakota, as well as the Dakota First Nations tribe which is a Native American Indian tribe in North America. And the species name is in honor of paleontologist Walter W. Stein. So not only is it the first giant dromaeosaurid from the Hell Creek Formation, it's also the most recent found in the entire world. And by most recent, I mean the closest to the KT extinction. As far as dromaeosaurids, two of the best known are probably Utah Raptor and Deinonychus, Deinonychus is smaller than Utah Raptor. I think I always think Utah Raptor is the best known because it's basically the one that's in Jurassic Park that they call Velociraptor, even though it doesn't have feathers and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty close, and when you hear Raptor, I think most people are imagining Utah Raptor more or less. And both of those were from the early Cretaceous, so they would have been long gone by the time Dakota Raptor was around. But there were still Dromaeosaurids around at the time of Dakota Raptor, like Sora Ornitholestes and Velociraptor, but they were a lot smaller. And there, I should point out, there is one related dinosaur, another Dromaeosaurid, which is similar in size to Dakota Raptor, and it's called Austroraptor, which is also from the late Cretaceous, but it was in Australia, and that had already been separated by quite a bit of water from the Hell Creek area and Lower Laramidia. And it had been separated for many millions of years, so that's probably why the paper doesn't make any direct comparisons between the two. So one of the things that makes this discovery so awesome is that the medium-sized predator would have been around at the same time and place as T-Rex, and that means that they likely would have clashed. And according to De Palma in an interview with the Smithsonian, quote, it could have given a juvenile T-Rex a run for its money, and a pack of them could have taken on an adult T-Rex. The discovery itself was partial fossils of the wing or arm, the leg, tail, abdomen, and, quote, raptorial pedal ungule. And what that means, <laughs> that's the scientific way that they decided to describe the awesome claw that the dromaeosaurids are known for. It's that one, you know, the curved sickle thing that sticks out of their foot. And I should mention that Dakota Raptor had a really large, awesome one. So they combine those bones with known material from Utah Raptor, Dromaeosaurus, Deinonychus, and Achillobator to approximate the size and shape of a full adult. They concluded it was probably about 17 feet long and would have been very closely related to a Utah Raptor. Its lean body and tibia and femur to metatarsus ratio would have given it a great sprinting capability, and De Palma said, quote, this is the most lethal thing you could possibly throw into the Hell Creek ecosystem. Dakota Raptor was probably the fastest predator in the entire Hell Creek formation, and it was the Ferrari of raptors, <laughs> which is a really awesome way to describe it. That is, and just really quick, I'm wondering if when we spoke with the Saurian team a few weeks back, 
and Nick, who was the project lead of the game, he mentioned that there was something really cool in the works, and they were basically just waiting to release a paper on it. So I wonder if this is what he meant by that. Yeah, that would be a really good choice. So onto the other amazing thing about this dinosaur, it's, quote, quill knobs, indicative of elongate stiffened feathers on the forearms, is unprecedented in giant dromaeosaurids and requires a re-examination of trends in quill knob evolution, end quote. In other words, they found strong mounting points for feathers on the arms, or wings, of Dakota Raptor, and because there were such strong mounting points, they believed that the feathers weren't necessarily just there for display. They could have possibly used them for something else as well. So they aren't really sure what these feathers were used for, but they made a lot of fun possible guesses. So one of them was that they were left over from flying, like how a modern ostrich has big wings and pretty strong feathers. And De Palma even related Dakota Raptor to a deadly ostrich, just like we were talking about in our last episode. They also mentioned that it could have been used to defend chicks, like modern hawks, apparently. So the way they described it was, quote, if you imagine a dozen squirming baby raptors that have the energy and tenacity of kittens knocking into your wings, then that could warrant some quill knobs as well. <laughs> Which is a pretty good description, I guess, you know, they didn't have hack and plays or cribs, so you gotta pin them in with feathers. <laughs> they could have also used them to frighten off or impress other dinosaurs. And at first I was, you know, people talk about how feathers aren't necessarily that scary, but I just heard a funny story from my mom who lives in the middle of nowhere in Missouri, and her dog was running up to an owl, probably, to attack it because it kills chickens and things all the time. And the owl spread its wings out and just kind of like made some, you know, spread its wings out and made a few noises at the dog. And the dog turned around and sprinted away. <laughs> so I could definitely see some strong, large feathers being intimidating to other animals. And then the last possibility is... They could have used their feathers to pin down prey, and that's probably the most unique one that I saw there, and that's what the Smithsonian article actually used in their title, because it does sound kind of weird to use feathers to pin down prey, but I guess if the prey's small enough, you could do it. All of this adds up to it being a totally awesome dinosaur. It might be my new favorite. With those quills on its arms, it basically had wings, but also had the claws and the sickle on its foot, and it could sprint so quickly it was around with T-Rex. And I always liked the dinosaurs that were around at the very end a little bit better because I imagine them as, like, the most advanced ones, even though I know that's a simplification. But you should definitely check out the pictures on smithsonian.com because they're really awesome. And it's cool to see with all the feathers and some of the concept art that they made. Next up, we've talked with Jack Horner about his study of Myasaura and the Egg Mountain Bone Bed in Montana. And now a paleohistologist, which, if you don't know, that's somebody who studies bone structure, has published a study of the bones found in Egg Mountain. It's Holly Woodward and colleagues. It's a big deal because it's so rare to be able to study enough fossils and specimens from the same place to get an idea of a dinosaur population, especially since there are so many that are partial skeletons. So these researchers looked at 50 tibia from 32 individuals and cut into bones to study the dinosaur ages and how fast they grew. And they found that most of the dinosaurs were under a year old when they died and had an 89.9% mortality rate. Only 11 tibia came from myosaur that were 7 years or older, and only 5 of them had a growth marker that showed that they were done growing. So the mature dinosaurs had a 44.4% mortality rate. For this particular population, there was probably a drought or disease which affected the youngest and oldest in the group. But interestingly, their survival rates are comparable to red deer and doll sheep. Next in the news is another article. This one's titled, Estimating Cranial Musculoskeletal Constraints in Theropod Dinosaurs, and it was published in the journal Royal Society Open Science. It was written by Stephen Lautenschlager. So, if you're like me, you might find yourself often defending T. rex's tiny arms to friends. And this is probably one of the most common things people bring up to me when I mention that I have a dinosaur podcast. They'll ask, like, why are T-Rex's arms so small? It's so stupid. Why didn't it have bigger arms? And then I always get out a picture of a T-Rex, and I show the center of mass. And I'm like, well, its legs are here, and its tail was really big, but still, it had such a huge skull that it would have fallen over if it had big arms. And then people say, but wouldn't bigger arms help more than having a huge head? 
you know, it seems like it would really suck to have such little arms. And then my answer is always, well, <laughs> my answer tends to be something like, well, maybe not, because its head was so awesome that it didn't even need arms. It could just rip off chunks and eat them that way. So that's pretty related to this article. <laughs> So the study basically sought to see how some of the best known theropods use their mouths and whether or not their mouth's capabilities matched with our assumed behaviors based on other details that we know about the dinosaurs like teeth. So specifically, Lawton Schlager made digital 3D models of a T-Rex, Allosaurus, and a Therizinosaur as a proof of concept. And as a proof of concept, he also included a modern bird of prey as well as a crocodile. He then added muscles to the skull models based on likely attachment points to simulate how their mouths would have moved. And his primary way of doing this was to simulate strain on the muscles when they were opened and comparing that to the strain of current kind of established maximum. Although there's a little bit of disagreement there. He used 170% strain as a maximum. And then he used kind of an ideal number that's a little bit more agreed on. This would give the maximum angle that the dinosaurs could open their mouths, which he hoped would give them a little insight into how they ate. So his model is really sensitive to the muscle resting length, and that's basically the amount the animal's mouth is open at rest. So you can think of a crocodile when it's laying there and its mouth is partly open and it looks really scary. It's probably actually doing that because the way its muscles are structured, that's the easiest place for its mouth to rest. It's not like, oh, it's about to bite something. It's actually just at rest with its mouth a little bit open. So he modeled at three and six degrees because at nine degrees, it lost a lot of its biting force and the resting angles of three and six degrees matched pretty closely between his crocodile model and what real crocodiles can open their mouths to. So there's lots of gloriously nerdy stuff in the article that shows what software he used and the different strain profiles at the gape angles. And we'll post a link to it on our blog, but just to summarize, Allosaurus recorded the largest gape angle at 79 to 92 degrees when reaching maximum tension limit, which was quite a bit larger than the T-Rex of 63 and a half to 80 degrees. And at the 92 degrees that the Allosaurus skull got to, the picture of it reminded me of a snake because it's open so wide. I mean, it's past 90 degrees, so it's huge opening. And that would just be terrifying in real life to see that kind of thing coming at you. The Therizinosaur only got to a comparatively small 43.5 to 49 degrees before reaching its maximum tension limit. So the three theropods he studied all are generally thought to have different feeding styles. Specifically, the T-Rex is thought to have had a powerful bite and strong teeth that it used in a puncture and pull method to crush bone and soft tissues. The strain model shows that the T-Rex would have maintained a powerful bite throughout the range of motion, which could have allowed it to have that bone-crushing ability that we've heard about, so there wasn't any conflict there. With the Allosaurus, it had a comparably weak bite, and it's thought that with its weaker jaw muscles, it would have used its neck muscles in combination and used a strike and tear method that has already been partially validated by its jaw joint configuration, which showed that it could have these really wide mouth openings without the risk of dislocation. And obviously this article showed that it could open its mouth really far, so that's further support. And then finally, the Therizinosaurian, with its relatively small gape, also makes sense, as they point out that living mammalian carnivores typically have much wider bites than herbivores, which matches the assumptions made about their small, densely packed, leaf-shaped teeth, indicating that it was probably an herbivore, so that also matches. He did mention that his models are simplified, and they don't account for his muscles routing around other bones or muscles, but he believes that it's a good comparison tool. And considering his results already have a fair amount of sensitivity to the resting gape angle, it doesn't seem like these slight omissions in his model would have been a huge issue. So Lautenschlager hopes that this technique could be applied to different muscle configurations and interactions in the future, and obviously we could use similar models on other dinosaurs to get ideas about their behavior as well. Since we're only a couple weeks away until The Good Dinosaur comes out, I've got a new little tidbit about the Pixar movie. So The Good Dinosaur is going to be featuring two composers, and as we've mentioned before, this movie will be focusing on the music, 
which is a little bit unlike other Pixar films. So the composers are Michael and Jeff Dana, and Michael created the Life of Pi score, and the team was nominated for an Emmy for their score for the TV show Tyrant. And in addition to using an 85-piece orchestra, they also incorporated fiddles, mandolin recorders, and a piano to give it an early America frontier feel. So that will be interesting. Actually, that should go along with what we've heard about at least the three T-Rexes in the movie. They're going to be kind of a frontier-like. And also, I think one of them they were contemplating adding a mustache to. So. <laughs> and one final journal article titled A New Brachylophosaurian Hadrosaur from Ornithischia with an intermediate nasal crest from the Campanian Judith River Formation of North Central Montana. It was published in the journal PLOS One by Elizabeth Friedman Fowler and Jack Horner. So the dinosaur is named Probrachylophosaurus, which means before short crested lizard, and that comes from the assumption that it is an ancestor of Brachylophosaurus canadensis, but the species name of this Probrachylophosaurus is Bergii, and that's, quote, in memory of Sam Berge, co-owner of the land where the specimen was discovered and friend and relative of many members of the Rudyard, Montana community who have supported paleontologic research for decades. It was discovered more or less right on the Montana side of the U.S.-Canadian border, and the species that is assumed to follow it, quote, canadensis, has been found both in Alberta, Canada, as you'd guess from the name, and Montana. So it's really like right on the border there. It's all in Alberta and Montana is where you find these kinds of dinosaurs. So it's similar to Myasaura pebulsorum, which was our dinosaur of the day in episode 37, and Sabrina was just talking about minutes ago. And we also interviewed Jack Horner in that episode. So it's a lot related to that episode going on here. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the description of this group of dinosaurs because Sabrina did such a good job in episode 37. But they did recover most of its skull, its pelvis, hind legs, vertebrae, and ribs. They also compare the adult fossil to one which is believed to be an adolescent of the same species that was found about one mile away from the adult. They estimate that it was about 30 feet or 9 meters long, weighed about 5 tons, and was about 14 years old. And Friedman Fowler nicknamed it Super Duck since it was pretty big for a hadrosaur, and I think that's one of the better dinosaur nicknames I've heard. Yeah, I like it. I hear da -da -da, super duck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reason they think it was a transition fossil is its skull had a similar shape to Acrostavus, which was around about 81 million years ago, and Brachylophosaurus, which was around about 78 million years ago, and then this Probrachylophosaurus was around about 80 million years ago, which seemed to split the gap there, and also it had a lot of features in common with both of them. Jack Horner also said, quote, because the fossil record is very spotty and we only get glimpses of evolutionary trends, it is always exciting to find evidence of transitional species, end quote, which does seem to be the case in this one, and pretty interesting. It's always nice to see these dinosaurs filling in gaps. It gives us a better understanding of how they evolved and everything, so cool. And one last thing in the news, the University of Kansas made a free app, it's iPhone or iPad only right now, but it will help people find and classify fossils. And according to Bruce Lieberman, a professor, quote, the app links to pictures, maps, and information about how long ago fossils occurred. The whole idea is to encourage people to get more excited about fossils, and it sounds like it's a pretty cool app. And that wraps up the news. Now on for the dinosaur of the day, Alamosaurus. And Alamosaurus was requested from Tad via email, so thanks, Tad. Alamosaurus's name means Ojo Alamo Wizard. There's only one species. It's the Alamosaurus sanwanensis. The holotype was found in June 1921 by Charles Gilmore, John Reeside, and Charles Sternberg in the Ojo Alamo Formation of New Mexico. Some people call it the Kirtland Formation. Other bones since have been found in Utah and Texas. For example, a juvenile was found in Texas. Gilmore described the species in 1922 and named it. It is not named after the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, or after the battle that happened there. When it was named, Alamosaurus bones had not yet even been found in Texas. So the name comes from Ojo Alamo, the geologic formation where the bones were found, which was named after the Ojo Alamo trading post. And some debate 
whether or not to reclassify this area as the Kirtland Formation or whether to keep it as the Ojo Alamo Formation. And I'll admit, before researching for this dinosaur, I had only heard of the Kirtland Formation. In Spanish, the word Alamo means poplar, which is the local cottonwood tree. San Juanensis is named after San Juan County, New Mexico, where the bones were found. Gilmore posthumously described a more complete Alamosaurus in 1946 that was found in 1937 in Utah by George Pierce. They had found a complete tail and a right forelimb, though it didn't have any fingers. Since then, hundreds of pieces of fossils have been found in Texas, New Mexico, and Utah that have been referred to as Alamosaurus. This includes the fossils found of a juvenile and three fragmentary specimens. Not really any complete specimens have been found yet. And just a note on juvenile specimens. Juveniles tend to be more common finds because sediment covers smaller bodies more easily. The most complete specimen of Alamosaurus found is the juvenile that was found in Texas. Bits of Alamosaurus skeletons are some of the most common finds of late Cretaceous fossils in the southwest in the U.S., and they're used to help define the fauna from then. They're called the Alamosaurus fauna. Vertebrae and limb bones have been found, which show that Alamosaurus was around the same size as Argentinosaurus, and it may be the largest known dinosaur in North America. It may have weighed as much as 73 tons. Dana Biasetti, a grad student from the University of Texas in Dallas, found pelvic bones in 10 articulated cervical vertebrae of an adult Alamosaurus in 1999 in the Javelina Formation of Big Bend National Park. It's quote-unquote Big Bend Alamosaurus. It may have been up to 100 feet long and weighing over 50 tons. Before, the estimate was that Alamosaurus was about 65 feet or 20 meters long, and that's based on the juvenile skeleton and the partial adult skeletons. The bones that they found were so large and the area was so remote that Big Bend National Park issued a permit to remove the bones via helicopter in 2001, and it was the first quote-unquote dinosaur airlift. We mentioned, I think it was last episode, about the Pentaceratops in New Mexico being airlifted, but Alamosaurus was the first one. In 2009, Holly Woodward found that the femur of an Alamosaurus bone was still growing, so researchers knew it got bigger. And once again, Holly Woodward is the one who studied the Myasaur bone and seems to specialize in looking at the femurs and tibia bones and figure out dinosaur growth rates. So Alamosaurus lived in the Cretaceous in North America. And before Alamosaurus, there seems to be around a 30 million year gap where sauropods may have died out in North America and then Alamosaurus appeared. Sauropods tended to be more common at the end of the Jurassic, but it could be that we just haven't found the fossils of more sauropods yet. Alamosaurus may prove that immigration occurred from South America since Alamosaurus appeared and then became dominant in North America so abruptly. Some scientists think that it emigrated from Asia, but it's not very likely that they cross bodies of water. It's possible they may have also descended from North American relatives. If Alamosaurus had come from Asia, it would have crossed the Bering Strait land bridge. And one argument for why it may have come from Asia is because Alamosaurus is part of the Opisthocelacodonae group of titanosaurs, and the type genus of that group is from Asia. But this group is also within Saltosauridae, and Alamosaurus has a lot in common with Saltosaurus, so maybe it came from South America. Although, at the time, South America was probably separated from North America by an ocean. And also, South American dinosaurs, like Albulosaurus theropods, are not found in North America, and North American tyrannosaurs are not found in South America, so it seems unlikely that there was a lot of migration there. It could be that there was some kind of convergent of evolution instead. But anyway, one study found that as many as 350,000 Alamosauruses may have lived in Texas, in what is now Texas, at any given time. Alamosaurus was quadrupedal, with a long neck and tail and long limbs, and it had some bony armor. In 2015, Michael Brett Sermon confirmed this, based on findings in 2009, that blocks of bone impressions contained osteoderms. And osteoderms are bony plates on the skin, and it's actually found in other titanosaurs. No skull's been found, but rod-shaped teeth have been found nearby Alamosaurus skeletons, so they're probably Alamosaurus teeth. Dinosaurs that lived alongside Alamosaurus included Tyrannosaurs, smaller theropods, Hadrosaurs, and Kylosaurs, and Ceratopsids. Juvenile Alamosaurus may have been prey to Tyrannosaurs, though an adult Alamosaurus would have been too large. If you want to see Alamosaurus, it appears in a PBS Kids special, Remember the Alamosaurus. <laughs> it's a cute name. Gilmore only classified Alamosaurus as a general sauropod. He wasn't sure in 1922 when he was describing it about other classifications. And it was Friedrich von Huhn that classified it as a titanosaur in 1927. 
Still, it's unclear where exactly it falls in the titanosaur group. Titanosaurs were a group of sauropods and some of the heaviest land animals to live. Argentinosaurus, for example, is estimated to have weighed up to 90 tons. They're named for the now dubious genus Titanosaurus, and Titanosaurus was named after the titans of ancient Greece. Not all paleontologists, however, consider them a group because Titanosaurus is dubious, but for the ones who do, it's the last group of sauropods. They were widespread. They lived in Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand. Every continent, actually. Mm hmm. And they had small heads, even for sauropods, but they were also wide heads. <laughs> a lot of fragmentary fossils and not too many skulls have been found. They had large nostrils, though, and crests formed by nasal bones. And they had small teeth that were either spoon like or peg or pencil like. They had whip like tails, too, although not as long as diplodocids. And they had wider chests than most sauropods and a wide stance. They also had stocky forelimbs that were longer than their hind limbs. And skin impressions show that they may have had bead-like scales or even bony plates like ankylosaurs. A titanosaur nesting ground was found in Argentina and Spain, with several hundred holes with clutches around 25 eggs in each clutch. And for a fun fact, I have to point out one last thing about Jurassic World that bugs me every time I watch it, now that we have it, and I've watched it a couple times. <laughs> I don't think I've mentioned it before, but I'm sure I'm not the only person who's noticed this. There's a line at the end of the movie where the boy, Gray, is adding up the teeth of the fighting dinosaurs, and he says, we need more teeth, because he's, you know, doing the math. Well, clearly, what he should have done is gotten a hadrosaur involved, because <laughs> they could have had almost a thousand teeth compared to the T-Rex, which only had about 60. That wouldn't have been nearly as good of a fight scene. It wouldn't have. <laughs> I think... Maybe the argument should have been we need less teeth because the carnivores always seem to have less teeth than the herbivores. I think it should have been we need more bite or we need more bite force. Or we need more mass or something. The <laughs> teeth is just such a goofy thing to go for. But anyway. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you again so much to our Patreon supporters. We really do appreciate you. And we're going to be making a short little clip to show you how much we appreciate you soon. So stay tuned for that. And in the clip, we're going to show off our new equipment that you guys helped us buy. Yep. So if you want to support us, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at inodino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to inodino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at inodino.